The Face of a Stranger By and Perry His name they tell him, is William Monk And he is a London police detective, but the accident that failed him, has left him with only half a life his memory and his entire past have vanished. And now the face of a stranger. To listen to more audiobook and best story by and Perry for free, check Amazon Audible. Link can be found in the description or the first comment. Chapter 1 He opened his eyes, and saw nothing but a pale greyness above him, uniform, like a winter sky, threatening and heavy. He blinked and looked again. He was lying flat on his back. The greyness was a ceiling, dirty with the grime and trapped fumes of years. He moved slightly. The bed he was lying on was hard and short. He made an effort to sit up and found it acutely painful. Inside his chest a fierce pain stabbed him, and his left arm was heavily bandaged and aching. As soon as he was half up, his head thumped as if his pulse were a hammer behind his eyes. There was another wooden cot, just like his own, a few feet away, and a pasty-faced man lay on it, moving restlessly, grey blanket mangled, and sweat staining his shirt. Beyond him was another, blood-soaked bandages swathing the legs. And beyond that, another. And so on down the great room to the black-bellied stove at the far end and the smoke-scored ceiling above it. Panic exploded inside him, hot prickling through his skin. He was in a workhouse. God in heaven, how had he come to this? But it was broad daylight. Awkwardly shifting his position, he stared around the room. There were people in all the cots. They lined the walls, and every last one was occupied. No workhouse in the country allowed that. They should be up and laboring for the good of their souls, if not for the workhouse purse. Not even children were granted the sin of idleness. Of course, it was a hospital. It must be. Very carefully, he lay down again, relief overwhelming him as his head touched the bran pillow. He had no recollection of how he had come to be in such a place, no memory of having hurt himself, and yet he was undoubtedly injured. His arm was stiff and clumsy. He was aware now of a deep ache in the bone, and his chest hurt him sharply every time he breathed in. There was a thunderstorm raging inside his head. What had happened to him? must have been a major accident. A collapsing wall? A violent throw from a horse? A fall from a height? But no impression came back, not even a memory of fear. He was still struggling to recall something when a grinning face appeared above him, and a voice spoke cheerfully. Now then, you awake again, are you? He stared upwards, focusing on the moon face. It was broad and blunt, with a chapped skin and a smile that stretched wide over broken teeth. He tried to clear his head. Again, he said confusedly. The past lay behind him in dreamless sleep, like a white corridor without a beginning. You're a right one, you are, the voice sighed good-humouredly. You don't know nothing from one day to the next, do you? It wouldn't surprise me none if you didn't remember your own name. How are you, then? How's your arm? My name? There was nothing there, nothing at all. Yeah. The voice was cheerful and patient. What's your name, then? He must know his name. Of course he must. It was... Blank seconds ticked by. Well, then, the voice pressed. He struggled. Nothing came except a white panic like a snowstorm in the brain, whirling and dangerous and without focus. You forgot. The voice was stoic and resigned. I thought so. 
Well, the Peelers was here day afore yesterday, and they said you was Monk, William Monk. Now, what are you gone and done that the Peelers is after you? He pushed helpfully at the pillow with enormous hands, and then straightened the blanket. You like a nice hot drink then, or something? Proper parky it is even in here. July, and it feels like ruddy November. I'll get you a nice hot drink of gruel. How's that then? Raining a flood outside, it is. You're best off in here. William Monk. He repeated the name. That's right. Leastways, that's what the peelers says. Feller called Runcorn. He was Mister Runcorn, a inspector, no less. He raised scruffy eyebrows. What you done then? You one of them swell mob what goes around pinching gentlemen's wallets and gold watches? There was no criticism in his round, benign eyes. That's what you looked like when they brought you in here. Proper natty dressed you was, underneath the mud and torn up stuff like, and all that blood. Monk said nothing. His head reeled, pounding in an effort to perceive anything in the mists, even one clear, tangible memory. But even the name had no real significance. William had a vague familiarity, but it was a common enough name. Everyone must know dozens of Williams. So you don't remember," the man went on, his face friendly and faintly amused. He had seen all manner of human frailty, and there was nothing so fearful or so eccentric. It disturbed his composure. He had seen men die of the pox and the plague, or climb the wall in terror of things that were not there. A grown man who couldn't remember yesterday was a curiosity, but nothing to marvel at. Or else you ain't saying," he went on. "Don't blame you," he shrugged. "Don't do to give the peelers nothing as you don't have to. Now, do you feel like a spot of hot gruel? Nice and thick it is. Been sitting on that there stove a fair while. Put a bit of art into you." Monk was hungry, and even under the blanket, he realised he was cold. "Yes, please," he accepted. Righto, then gruel it is. I suppose I'll be a telling you your name tomorrow, just the same, and you'll look at me all gormless again. He shook his head. Either you hit your head something horrible, or you're scared of your wits of them peelers. What you done? You pinch the crown jewels. And he went off, chuckling with laughter to himself, up to the black-bellied stove at the far end of the ward. Police? Was he a thief? The thought was repellent, not only because of the fear attached to it, but for itself, what it made of him. And yet he had no idea if it might be true. Who was he? What manner of man? Had he been hurt doing something brave, rash, or chased down like an animal for some crime? Or was he merely unfortunate, a victim in the wrong place at the wrong time? He racked his mind and found nothing, not a shred of thought or sensation. He must live somewhere, no people with faces, voices, emotions. And there was nothing. For all that his memory held, he could have sprung into existence here in the hard cot in this bleak hospital ward. But he was known to someone, the police. The man returned with the gruel, and carefully fed it to Monk, a spoonful at a time. It was thin and tasteless, but he was grateful for it. Afterwards, he lay back again, and struggle as he might, even fear couldn't keep him from deep, apparently dreamless sleep. To listen to more audiobook and best story by and Perry for free, check Amazon Audible. Link can be found in the description or the first comment. When he woke the following morning, at least two things were perfectly clear this time: his name and where he was. 
He could remember the meager happenings of the previous day quite sharply. The nurse, the hot gruel, the man in the next cot turning and groaning, the grey-white ceiling, the feel of the blankets and the pain in his chest. He had little idea of time, but he judged it to be somewhere in the mid-afternoon when the policeman came. He was a big man, or he appeared so in the caped coat and top hat of Peel's Metropolitan Police Force. He had a bony face, long nose and wide mouth, a good brow, but deep-set eyes too small to tell the colour of easily, a pleasant enough countenance and intelligent, but showing small signs of temper between the brows and about the lips. He stopped at Monk's cot. Well, do you know me this time, then? he asked cheerfully. Monk didn't shake his head. It hurt too much. No, he said simply. The man mastered his irritation, and something that might even have been disappointment. He looked Monk up and down closely, narrowing one eye in a nervous gesture, as if he would concentrate his vision. You look better today, he pronounced. Was that the truth? Did he look better? Or did Runcorn merely want to encourage him? For that matter, what did he look like? He had no idea. Was he dark or fair? Ugly or pleasing? Was he well-built or ungainly? He couldn't even see his hands, let alone his body, beneath the blankets. He wouldn't look now. He must wait till Runcorn was gone. Don't remember anything, I suppose, Runcorn continued. Don't remember what happened to you? No. Monk was fighting with a cloud totally without shape. Did this man know him, or merely of him? Was he a public figure Monk ought to recognise? Or did he pursue him for some dutiful and anonymous purpose? Might he only be looking for information, or could he tell Monk something about himself more than a bare name, put flesh and memory to the bleak fact of his presence? Monk was lying on the cot, clothed up to his chin, and yet he felt mentally naked, vulnerable as the exposed and ridiculous are. His instinct was to hide, to conceal his weakness. And yet he must know. There must be dozens, perhaps scores of people in the world who knew him, and he knew nothing. It was a total and paralyzing disadvantage. He didn't even know who loved or hated him, whom he had wronged or helped. His need was like that of a man who starves for food and yet is terrified that in any mouthful may lurk poison. He looked back at the policeman. Runcorn, the nurse had said his name was. He must commit himself to something. Did I have an accident? he asked. Looked like it, Runcorn replied matter-of-factly. Handsome was turned over. Right mess. He must have hit something at a hell of a lick horse frightened out of its wits. He shook his head and pulled the corners of his mouth down. Cabby killed outright, poor devil. Hit his head on the curb. You were inside, so I suppose you were partly protected. Had a swine of a job to get you out. Dead weight. Never realized you were such a solid fella. Don't remember it, I suppose. Not even the fright. Again, his left eye narrowed a little. No. No images came to Monk's mind, no memory of speed or impact, not even pain. Don't remember what you were doing, Runcorn went on, without any real hope in his voice. What case you were on? Monk seized on a brilliant hope, a thing with shape. He was almost too afraid to ask, in case it crumbled at his touch. He stared at Runcorn. He must know this man, personally, perhaps even daily. And yet nothing in him woke the slightest recall. Well, man, Runcorn demanded, do you remember? You weren't anywhere we sent you. What the devil were you doing? You must have discovered something yourself. Can you remember what it was? 
the blank was impenetrable. Monk moved his head fractionally in negation, but the bright bubble inside him stayed. He was a peeler himself. That was why they knew him. He wasn't a thief, not a fugitive. Runcorn leaned forward a little, watching him keenly, seeing the light in his face. You do remember something, he said triumphantly. Come on, man, what is it? Monk couldn't explain that it wasn't a memory that changed him, but a dissolving of fear in one of the sharpest forms it had taken. The entire suffocating blanket was still there, but characterless now, without specific menace. Runcorn was still waiting, staring at him intently. No, Monk said slowly. Not yet. Runcorn straightened up. He sighed, trying to control himself. It'll come. How long have I been here? Monk asked. I've lost count of time. It sounded reasonable enough. Anyone ill might do that. Over three weeks. It's the 31st of July, 1856, he added with a touch of sarcasm. Dear God, over three weeks, and all he could remember was yesterday. He shut his eyes. It was infinitely worse than that. A whole lifetime of how many years? And all he could remember was yesterday. How old was he? How many years were lost? Panic boiled up inside him again, and for a moment he could have screamed. Help me, somebody. Who am I? Give me back my life, myself. But men didn't scream in public. Even in private, they didn't cry out. The sweat stood cold on his skin, and he lay rigid, hands clenched by his sides. Runcorn would take it for pain, ordinary physical pain. He must keep up the appearance. He mustn't let Runcorn think he had forgotten how to do his job. Without a job, the workhouse would be a reality, grinding, hopeless, day after day of obedient, servile, pointless labor. He forced himself back to the present. Over three weeks? Yes, Runcorn replied. Then he coughed and cleared his throat. Perhaps he was embarrassed. What does one say to a man who cannot remember you, who cannot even remember himself? Monk felt for him. It'll come back, Runcorn repeated. When you're up again, when you're back on the job. You want a break to get well. That's what you need. A break till you get your strength. Take a week or two. About two. Come back to the station when you're fit to work. It'll all come clear then, I dare say. Yes, Monk agreed, more for Runcorn's sake than his own. He didn't believe it. To listen to more audiobook and best story by and parry for free, check Amazon Audible. Link can be found in the description or the first comment. Monk left the hospital three days later. He was strong enough to walk, and no one stayed in such places longer than they had to. It wasn't only financial consideration, but the sheer danger. More people died of cross infection than of any illness or injury that brought them there in the first place. This much was imparted to him in a cheerfully resigned manner by the nurse who had originally told him his name. It was easy to believe... In the short days he could remember, he had seen doctors move from one bloody or festering wound to another, from fever patient to vomiting and flux, then to open sores and back again. Soiled bandages lay on the floor. There was little laundry done, although no doubt they did the best they could on the pittance they had. And to be fair, they did their utmost never knowingly to admit patients suffering from typhoid, cholera, or smallpox. And if they did discover these illnesses afterwards, they rectified their error. Those poor souls had to be quarantined in their own houses and left to die, 
or recover, if God were willing. There they would be of least peril to the community. Everyone was familiar with the black flag hanging limply at the ends of a street. Runcorn had left for him his peeler's coat and tall hat, carefully dusted off and mended after the accident. At least they fitted him, apart from being a trifle loose because of the weight he had lost lying on his back since the injury. But that would return. He was a strong man, tall and lean-muscled. But the nurse had shaved him, so he hadn't yet seen his face. He had felt it, touching with his fingertips when no one was watching him. It was strong-boned, and his mouth seemed wide. That was all he knew. And his hands were smooth and uncalloused by labour, with a scattering of dark hairs on the backs. Apparently he had had a few coins in his pocket when they brought him in, and these were handed to him as he left. Someone else must have paid for his treatment. Presumably his police salary had been sufficient. Now he stood on the steps with eight shillings and eleven pence, a cotton handkerchief, and an envelope with his name and 27 Grafton Street written on it. It contained a receipt from his tailor. He looked around him and recognised nothing. It was a bright day with fast scudding clouds and a warm wind. Fifty yards away, there was an intersection, and a small boy was wielding a broom, keeping the crossing clear of horse manure and other rubbish. A carriage swirled past, drawn by two high-stepping bays. Monk stepped down, still feeling weak, and made his way to the main road. It took him five minutes to see a vacant hansom, hail it and give the cabbie the address. He sat back inside and watched as streets and squares flickered by. Other vehicles, carriages, some with liveried footmen, more hansoms, brewers' drays, costermongers' carts. He saw peddlers and vendors, a man selling fresh eels, another with hot pies, plum duff. It sounded good. He was hungry, but he had no idea how much the fare would be, so he didn't dare stop. A newspaper boy was shouting something, but they passed him too quickly to hear above the horse's hooves. A one-legged man sold matches. There was a familiarity about the streets, but it was at the back of his mind. He couldn't have named a single one, simply that they didn't seem alien. Tottenham Court Road. It was very busy. Carriages, drays, carts... Women in wide skirts stepping over refuse in the gutter. Two soldiers laughing and a little drunk. Red coats, a splash of colour. A flower seller and two washerwomen. The cab swung left into Grafton Street and stopped. Here you are, sir. Number 27. Thank you. Monk climbed out awkwardly. He was still stiff and unpleasantly weak. Even that small exertion had tired him. He had no idea how much money to offer. He held out a florin, two sixpences, a penny, and a halfpenny in his hand. The cabby hesitated, then took one of the sixpences and the halfpenny, tipped his hat, and slapped the reins across his horse's rump, leaving Monk standing on the pavement. He hesitated. Now that the moment was come, overtaken with fear. He hadn't even the slightest idea what he should find, or whom. Two men passed, looking at him curiously. They must suppose him lost. He felt foolish, embarrassed. Who would answer his knock? Should he know them? If he lived here, they must know him. How well? Were they friends, or merely landlords? It was preposterous, but he didn't even know if he had a family. But if he had, surely they would have visited him. Runcorn had come, so they would have been told where he was. Or had he been the kind of man who inspires no love, only professional courtesy? Was that why Runcorn had called? Because it was his job? Had he been a good policeman, efficient at his work? Was he liked? It was ridiculous, pathetic. 
He shook himself. This was childish. If he had family, a wife or brother or sister, Runcorn would have told him. He must discover each thing as he could. If he was fit to be employed by the peelers, then he was a detective. He would learn each piece till he had enough to cobble together a whole, the pattern of his life. The first step was to knock on this door, dark brown and closed in front of him. He lifted his hand and rapped sharply. It was long, desperate minutes with the questions roaring in his mind before it was opened by a broad, middle-aged woman in an apron. Her hair was scraped back untidily, but it was thick and clean, and her scrubbed face was generous. Well, I never, she said impulsively. Save my soul if it ain't Mr. Monk back again. I was only saying to Mr. Worley this very morning, as how if you didn't come back again soon, I'd have to let your rooms, much as it'd go against me to do it. But a body has to live. Mind, that Mr. Uncorn did come around and say as you'd had a accident and been terrible hurt, and was in one of them hospitals. She put her hand to her head in despair. God save us from such places. You're the first man I've seen as has come out of there on his own two feet. To tell you the truth, I was expecting every day to have some messenger boy come and say as you was dead. She screwed up her face and looked at him carefully. Mind, you does still look proper poorly. Come in, and I'll make you a good meal. You must be starved. I dare swear you haven't had a decent dish since you left here. It were as cold as a workhouse master's art the day you went. And she whisked her enormous skirts around and led him inside. He followed her through the panelled hallway, hung with sentimental pictures, and up the stairs to a large landing. She produced a bunch of keys from her girdle and opened one of the doors. I suppose you're gone and lost your own key, or you wouldn't have knocked. That stands to reason, don't it? I had my own key, he asked, before realising how it betrayed him. Good save us, of course you did, she said in surprise. You don't think I'm going to get up and down at all hours of the night to let you in and out, do you? A Christian body needs her sleep. Heathen hours you keeps, and no mistake, comes a chasing after heathen folk, I spec. She turned to look at him. Here. Yeah. You does look ill. You must have been it something terrible. You go in there and sit down, and I'll bring you a good hot meal and a drink. Do you the world of good, that will. She snorted and straightened her apron fiercely. I always thought them hostibitals didn't look after you proper. I'll wager as half of them what dies in there dies of starvation. And with indignation at the thought twitching in every muscle under her black taffeta, she swept out of the room, leaving the door open behind her. Monk walked over and closed it, then turned to face the room. It was large, dark brown panelling and green wallpaper. The furniture was well used. A heavy oak table with four matching chairs stood in the centre, Jacobean with carved legs and decorated claw feet. The sideboard against the far wall was similar, although what purpose it served he didn't know. There was no china on it, and when he opened the drawers, no cutlery. However, the lower drawers did contain table linen and napkins, freshly laundered and in good repair. There was also an oak desk with two small flat drawers. Against the near wall, by the door, there was a handsome bookcase full of volumes part of the furniture, or his own. Later, he would look at the titles. The windows were draped rather than hung with fringed plush curtains of a mid-shade of green. The gas brackets on the walls were ornate, with pieces missing. The leather easy chair had faded patches on the arms, and the pile on the cushions was flat. The carpet's colours had long since dimmed to muted plums, navies, 
and forest greens, a pleasant background. There were several pictures of a self-indulgent tone and a motto over the mantelpiece with the dire warning, God sees all. Were they his? Surely not. The emotions jarred on him and he found himself pulling a face at the mawkishness of the subjects, even feeling a touch of contempt. It was a comfortable room, well lived in but peculiarly impersonal, without photographs or mementos, no mark of his own taste. His eyes went around it again and again, but nothing was familiar, nothing brought even a pinprick of memory. He tried the bedroom beyond. It was the same, comfortable, old, shabby. A large bed stood in the centre, made up ready with clean sheets, crisp white bolster and wine-coloured eiderdown flounced at the edges. On the heavy dresser there was a rather pleasant china wash bowl and a jug for water. A handsome silver-backed hairbrush lay on the tall boy. He touched the surfaces. His hands came away clean. Mrs. Worley was at least a good housekeeper. He was about to open the drawers and look further when there was a sharp rap on the outer door and Mrs. Worley returned, carrying a tray with a steaming plate piled with steak and kidney pudding, boiled cabbage, carrots and beans, and another dish with pie and custard. There you are, she said with satisfaction, setting it down on the table. He was relieved to see knife, fork and spoon with it and a glass of cider. You eat that and you'll feel better. Thank you, Mrs. Worley. His gratitude was genuine. He hadn't had a good meal since... It's my duty, Mr. Monk, as a Christian woman, she replied with a little shake of her head. And you're always paid me prompt. I'll say that for you. Never argued nor was a day late for aught else. Now, you eat that up. Then go to bed. You look properly done in. I don't know what you've been doing, and I don't want her. Probably ain't fit for a body to know anyway. What shall I do with the... He looked at the tray. Put it outside the door like you always does, she said with raised eyebrows. Then she looked at him more closely and sighed. And if you gets took poorly in the night, you best shout out, and I'll come and see to you. It won't be necessary. I shall be perfectly well. She sniffed and let out a little gasp, heavy with disbelief, then bustled out, closing the door behind her with a loud click. He realised immediately how ungracious he had been. She had offered to get up in the night to help him if he needed it and all he had done was assure her she wasn't needed. And she hadn't looked surprised or hurt. Was he always as discourteous? He paid. She said he paid promptly and without quibble. Was that all there was between them? No kindness, no feeling, just a lodger who was financially reliable and a landlady who did her Christian duty by him, because that was her nature. It was not an attractive picture. He turned his attention to the food. It was plain, but of excellent flavour, and she was certainly not ungenerous with her portions. It flickered through his mind with some anxiety to wonder how much he paid for these amenities and if he could much longer afford them while he was unable to work. The sooner he recovered his strength and enough of his wits to resume his duties for the police the better. He could hardly ask her for credit, particularly after her remarks and his manners. Please heaven he didn't owe her already for the time he was in the hospital. When he had finished the meal, he placed the tray outside on the landing table where she could collect it. He went back into the room, closed the door, and sat in one of the armchairs, intending to look through the desk in the window corner, but in the weariness and the comfort of the cushions, he fell asleep. When he woke, cold now and stiff, his side aching, it was dark and he fumbled to light the gas. 
He was still tired and would willingly have gone to bed, but he knew that the temptation of the desk and the fear of it would trouble even the most exhausted sleep. He lit the lamp above it and pulled open the top. There was a flat surface with inkstand, a leather writing block, and a dozen small closed drawers. He started at the top left-hand side and worked through them all. He must be a methodical man. There were receipted bills, a few newspaper clippings, entirely of crimes, usually violent, and describing brilliant police work in solving them. Three railway timetables, business letters, and a note from a tailor. A tailor? So that was where his money went. Vain beggar! He must take a look through his wardrobe and see what his taste was. Expensive, according to the bill in his hand. A policeman who wanted to look like a gentleman. He laughed sharply. A rat catcher with pretensions. Was that what he was? A somewhat ridiculous figure. The thought hurt, and he pushed it away with a black humour. In other drawers, there were envelopes, notepaper, good quality, vanity again. Whom did he write to? There was also sealing wax, string, a paper knife, and scissors, a number of minor items of convenience. It wasn't until the tenth drawer that he found the personal correspondence. They were all in the same hand. To judge from the formation of the letters, a young person, or someone of slight education. Only one person wrote to him, or only one whose letters he had considered worth keeping. He opened the first, angry with himself that his hands were shaking. It was very simple, beginning, "Dear William," full of homely news, and ending, "Your loving sister Beth." He put it down, the round characters burning in front of him, dizzy and overwhelmed with excitement and relief. And perhaps a shadow of disappointment he forced away. He had a sister. There was someone who knew him, had always known him. More than that, who cared? He picked up the letter again quickly, almost tearing it in his clumsiness to reread it. It was gentle, frank, and yes, it was affectionate. It must be. One did not speak so openly to someone one didn't trust and care for. And yet, there was nothing in it that was any kind of reply, no reference to anything he had written to her. Surely he did write. He couldn't have treated such a woman with cavalier disregard. What kind of man was he? If he had ignored her, not written, then there must be a reason. How could he explain himself, justify anything when he couldn't remember? It was like being accused. Standing in the dock with no defence, it was long, painful moments before he thought to look for the address. When he did, it came as a sharp, bewildering surprise. It was in Northumberland. He repeated it over and over to himself aloud. It sounded familiar, but he couldn't place it. He had to go to the bookcase and search for an atlas to look it up. Even so, he couldn't see it for several minutes. It was very small, a name in fine letters on the coast, a fishing village. A fishing village. What was his sister doing there? Had she married and gone there? The surname on the envelope was Bannerman. Or had he been born there, and then come south to London? He laughed sharply. Was that the key to his pretension? He was a provincial fisherman's son with eyes on passing himself off as something better. When, when had he come? He realized with a shock he didn't know how old he was. He still hadn't looked at himself in the glass. Why not? Was he afraid of it? Or did it matter how a man looked? And yet he was trembling. He swallowed hard and picked up the oil lamp from the desk. He walked slowly into the bedroom and put the lamp on the dresser. There must be a glass there, 
at least big enough to shave himself. It was on a swivel. That was why he hadn't noticed it before. His eye had been on the silver brush. He set the lamp down and slowly tipped the glass. The face he saw was dark and very strong. Broad, slightly aquiline nose, wide mouth, rather thin upper lip, lower lip fuller, with an old scar just below it, eyes intense, luminous grey in the flickering light. It was a powerful face, but not an easy one. If there was humour, it would be harsh, of wit rather than laughter. He could have been anything between thirty-five and forty-five. He picked up the lamp and walked back to the main room, finding the way blindly. His inner eye still seeing the face that had stared back at him from the dim glass. It wasn't that it displeased him especially, but it was the face of a stranger, and not one easy to know. The following day, he made his decision. He would travel north to see his sister. She would at least be able to tell him his childhood, his family, and to judge from her letters and the recent date of the last, she still held him in affection, whether he deserved it or not. He wrote in the morning, telling her simply that he had had an accident, but was considerably recovered now, and intended to visit her when he was well enough to make the journey, which he expected to be no more than another day or two at the outside. Among the other things in the desk drawer, he found a modest sum of money. Apparently, he wasn't extravagant except at the tailor. The clothes in his wardrobe were impeccably cut and of first quality fabric, and possibly the bookshop if the contents of the case were his. Other than that, he had saved regularly, but if for any particular purpose, there was no note of it, and it hardly mattered now. He gave Mrs. Worley what she asked for: a further month's rent on account, minus the food he wouldn't consume while he was away, and informed her he was going to visit his sister in Northumberland. Very good idea. She nodded her head sagaciously. More in time you paid her a visit, if you ask me. Not that you did, of course. I'm not one to interfere. She drew in her breath. But you ain't been off to see her since I known you. And that's some years now, and the poor soul writes to you regular, though when you writes back, I'm blessed if I know. She put the money in her pocket and looked at him closely. Well, you look after yourself, eat proper, and don't go doing any daft caperings around chasing folk. Let ruffians alone, and mind for yourself for a space. And with that parting advice, she smoothed her apron again. And turned away, her boot heels clicking down the corridor towards the kitchen. It was August the fourth when he boarded the train in London and settled himself for the long journey. To listen to more audio book and best story by and Perry for free, check Amazon Audible. Link can be found in the description or the first comment. Northumberland was vast and bleak, wind roaring over treeless, heather-darkened moors, but there was a simplicity about its tumultuous skies and clean earth that pleased him enormously. Was it familiar to him, memory stirring from childhood, or only beauty that would have woken the same emotion in him had it been as unknown as the plains of the moon? He stood a long time at the station, bag in his hand. Staring out at the hills before he finally made move to begin, he would have to find a conveyance of some kind. He was eleven miles from the sea and the hamlet he wanted. In normal health, he might well have walked it, but he was still weak. His rib ached when he breathed deeply, and he hadn't yet the full use of his broken arm. It was no more than a pony cart, and he had paid handsomely for it. He thought. But he was glad enough to have the driver take him to his sister's house, which he asked for by name, and deposit him and his bag on the narrow street in front of the door. As the wheels rattled away over the cobbles, 
He conquered his thoughts, the apprehension, and the sense of an irretrievable step, and knocked loudly. He was about to knock again when the door swung open and a pretty, fresh-faced woman stood on the step. She was bordering on the plump and had strong, dark hair and features reminiscent of his own, only in the broad brow and some echo of cheekbone. Her eyes were blue, and her nose had the strength without the arrogance, and her mouth was far softer. All this flashed into his mind with the realization that she must be Beth, his sister. She would find him inexplicable and probably be hurt if he didn't know her. Beth, he held out his hands. Her face broke into a broad smile of delight. William, I hardly knew you. You've changed so much. We got your letter. You said an accident. Are you hurt badly? We didn't expect you so soon. She blushed. Not that you aren't very welcome, of course. Her accent was broad Northumberland and he found it surprisingly pleasing to the ear. Was that familiarity again, or only the music of it after London? William? She was staring at him. Come inside. You must be tired out and hungry. She made as if to pull him physically into the house. He followed her, smiling in a sudden relief. She knew him. Apparently, she held no grudge for his long absence or the letters he hadn't written. There was a naturalness about her that made long explanations unnecessary. And he realized he was indeed hungry. The kitchen was small, but scrubbed clean. In fact, the table was almost white. It woke no cord of memory in him at all. There were warm smells of bread and baked fish and salt wind from the sea. For the first time since waking in the hospital, he found himself beginning to relax, to ease the knots out. Gradually, over bread and soup, he told her the facts he knew of the accident, inventing details where the story was so bare as to seem evasive. She listened while she continued to stir her cooking on the stove, warm the flat iron, and then began on a series of small children's clothes and a man's Sunday white shirt. If it was strange to her, or less than credible, she gave no outward sign. Perhaps the whole world of London was beyond her knowledge anyway, and inhabited by people who lived incomprehensible lives, which couldn't be hoped to make sense to ordinary people. It was the late summer dusk when her husband came in, a broad, fair man with wind-scoured face and mild features. His grey eyes still seemed tuned to the sea. He greeted Monk with friendly surprise, but no sense of dismay or of having been disturbed in his feelings or the peace of his home. No one asked Monk for explanations. Even the three shy children returned from chores and play, and since he had none to give, the matter was passed over. It was a strange mark of the distance between them, which he observed with a wry pain, that apparently he had never shared enough of himself with his only family that they noticed the omission. Day succeeded day. Sometimes golden bright, sun hot when the wind was offshore and the sand soft under his feet. Other times it swung east off the North Sea and blew with sharp chill and the breath of storm. Monk walked along the beach, feeling it rip at him, beating his face, tearing at his hair. And the very size of it was at once frightening and comforting. It had nothing to do with people. It was impersonal, indiscriminate. He had been there a week and was feeling the strength of life come back to him when the alarm was called. It was nearly midnight and the wind screaming around the stone corners of the houses when the shouts came and the hammering on the front door. Rob Bannerman was up within minutes, oilskins and sea boots on, still almost in his sleep. Monk stood on the landing in bewilderment, confused. At first, no explanation came to his mind as to the emergency. It wasn't until he saw Beth's face when she ran to the window, and he followed her, 
and saw below them the dancing lanterns and the gleam of light on moving figures, oilskin shining in the rain, that he realized what it was. Instinctively, he put his arm around Beth, and she moved fractionally closer to him, but her body was stiff. Under her breath, she was praying, and there were tears in her voice. Rob was already out of the house. He had spoken to neither of them, not even hesitated beyond touching Beth's hand as he passed her. It was a wreck, some ship driven by the screaming winds onto the outstretched fingers of rock, with God knew how many souls clinging to the sundering planks, water already swirling around their waists. After the first moment of shock, Beth ran upstairs again to dress, calling to Monk to do the same. Then everything was a matter of finding blankets, heating soup, rebuilding fires ready to help the survivors, if, please God, there were any. The work went on all night, the lifeboats going backwards and forwards, men roped together. Thirty-five people were pulled out of the sea. Ten were lost. Survivors were all brought back to the few homes in the village. Beth's kitchen was full of white-faced, shivering people, and she and Monk plied them with hot soup and what comforting words they could think of. Nothing was stinted. Beth emptied out every last morsel of food without a thought as to what her own family might eat tomorrow. Every stitch of dry clothing was brought out and offered. One woman sat in the corner, too numb with grief for her lost husband, even to weep. Beth looked at her with a compassion that made her beautiful. In a moment between tasks, Monk saw her bend and take the woman's hands, holding them between her own to press some warmth into them, speaking to her gently as if she had been a child. Monk felt a sudden ache of loneliness, of being an outsider whose involvement in this passion of suffering and pity was only chance. He contributed nothing but physical help. He couldn't even remember whether he had ever done it before, whether these were his people or not. Had he ever risked his life without grudge or question, as Rob Bannerman did? He hungered with a terrible need for some part in the beauty of it. Had he ever had courage, generosity? Was there anything in his past to be proud of, to cling to? There was no one he could ask. The moment passed, and the urgency of the present need overtook him again. He bent to pick up a child shaking with terror and cold, and wrapped it in a warm blanket, holding it close to his own body, stroking it with soft, repetitive words as he might have frightened animal. By dawn, it was over. The seas were still running high and hard, but Rob was back, too tired to speak, and too weary with loss of those the sea had taken. He simply took off his wet clothes in the kitchen and climbed up to bed. A week later, Monk was fully recovered physically. Only dreams troubled him, vague nightmares of fear, sharp pain, and a sense of being violently struck and losing his balance. Then a suffocation. He woke gasping, his heart racing and sweat on his skin, his breath rasping. But nothing was left except the fear, no thread to unravel towards recollection. The need to return to London became more pressing. He had found his distant past, his beginnings, but memory was virgin blank, and Beth could tell him nothing whatsoever of his life since leaving when she was still little more than a child. Apparently, he hadn't written of it, only trivialities, items of ordinary news such as one might read in the journals or newspapers, and small matters of his welfare and concern for hers. This was the first time he had visited her in eight years, something he wasn't proud to learn. He seemed a cold man, obsessed with his own ambition, had that compelled him to work so hard, or had he been so poor? He would like to think there was some excuse, but to judge from the money in his desk at Grafton Street, 
It hadn't lately been finance. He racked his brains to recall any emotion, any flash of memory as to what sort of man he was, what he had valued, what sort. Nothing came. No explanations for his self-absorption. He said goodbye to her and Rob, thanking them rather awkwardly for their kindness, surprising and embarrassing them, and because of it, himself too. But he meant it so deeply. Because they were strangers to him, he felt as if they had taken him in, a stranger, and offered him acceptance, even trust. They looked confused, Beth colouring shyly. But he didn't try to explain. He didn't have words, nor did he wish them to know. London seemed enormous, dirty and indifferent when he got off the train and walked out of the ornate, smoke-grimed station. He took a hansom to Grafton Street, announced his return to Mrs. Worley, then went upstairs and changed his clothes from those worn and crumpled by his journey. He took himself to the police station Runcorn had named when speaking to the nurse. With the experience of Beth and Northumberland behind him, he began to feel a little confidence. It was still another essay into the unknown, but with each step accomplished without unpleasant surprise, his apprehension lessened. When he climbed out of the cab and paid the driver, he stood on the pavement. The police station was as unfamiliar as everything else. Not strange, simply without any spark of familiarity at all. He opened the doors and went inside, saw the sergeant at the duty desk, and wondered how many hundreds of times before he had done exactly this. Not a noon, Mr. Monk. The man looked up with slight surprise and no pleasure. Nasty accident. Better now, are you, sir? There was a chill in his voice, a weariness. Monk looked at him. He was perhaps forty, round-faced, mild and perhaps a trifle indecisive, a man who could be easily befriended and easily crushed. Monk felt a stirring of shame and knew no reason for it, whatever, except the caution in the man's eyes. He was expecting Monk to say something to which he wouldn't be able to reply with assurance. He was a subordinate, and slower with words, and he knew it. Yes, I am. Thank you. Monk couldn't remember the man's name to use it. He felt contempt for himself. What kind of a man embarrasses someone who cannot retaliate? Why? Was there some long history of incompetence or deceit that would explain such a thing? You'll be wanting Mr. Runcorn, sir. The sergeant seemed to notice no change in Monk, and to be keen to speed him on his way. Yes, if he's in, please. The sergeant stepped aside a little and allowed Monk through the counter. Monk stopped, feeling ridiculous. He had no idea which way to go, and he would raise suspicion if he went the wrong way. He had a hot, prickly sensation that there would be little allowance made for him. He wasn't liked. You all right, sir? The sergeant said anxiously. Yes. Yes, I am. Is Mr. Runcorn still... He took a glance around and made a guess. At the top of the stairs. Yes, sir. Right where he always was. Thank you. And he set off up the steps rapidly, feeling a fool. Runcorn was in the first room on the corridor. Monk knocked and went in. It was dark and littered with papers and cabinets and baskets for filing, but comfortable in spite of a certain institutional bareness. Gas lamps hissed gently on the walls. Runcorn himself was sitting behind a large desk, chewing a pencil. Ah, he said with satisfaction when Monk came in. Fit for work, are you? About time. Best thing, work. Good for a man to work. Well, sit down, sit down. Think better sitting down. Monk obeyed, his muscles tight with tension. 
He imagined his breathing was so loud it must be audible above the gas. Good, good, Rancorn went on. Lot of cases, as always. I'll wager there's more stolen in some quarters of this city than is ever bought or sold honestly. He pushed away a pile of papers and set his pen in its stand. And the swell mob's been getting worse. All these enormous crinolines. Crinolines were made to steal from. So many petticoats on, no one can feel a dip. But that's not what I had in mind for you. Give you a good one to get your teeth into. He smiled mirthlessly. Monk waited. Nasty murder. He leaned back in his chair and looked directly at Monk. Haven't managed to do anything about it, though heaven knows we've tried. Had Lamb in charge. Poor fellow, sick and taken to his bed. Put you on the case. See what you can do. Make a good job of it. We've got to turn up some kind of result. Who was killed? Monk asked. And when? Fella called Jocelyn Gray, younger brother of Lord Shelburne, so you can see it's rather important we tidy it up. His eyes never left Monk's face. When? Well, that's the worst part of it. Rather a while ago, and we haven't turned up a damned thing. Nearly six weeks now. About when you had your accident. In fact, come to think of it, exactly then. Nasty night, thunderstorm and pouring with rain. Probably some ruffian followed him home, but made a very nasty job of it. Bashed the poor fella about to an awful state. Newspapers in an outrage, naturally crying for justice and what's the world coming to, where are the police and so on. We'll give you everything poor Lamb had, of course, and a good man to work with. Name of Evan, John Evan. Worked with Lamb till he took ill. See what you can do, anyway. Give them something. Yes, sir. Monk stood up. Where is Mr. Evan? Out somewhere. Trail's pretty cold. Start tomorrow morning, bright and early. Too late now. Go home and get some rest. Last night of freedom, eh? Make the best of it. Tomorrow I'll have you working like one of those railway diggers. Yes, sir. Monk excused himself and walked out. It was already darkening in the street, and the wind was laden with the smell of coming rain. But he knew where he was going, and he knew what he would do tomorrow, and it would be with identity and purpose. To listen to more audiobook and best story by and parry for free, check Amazon Audible. Link can be found in the description or the first comment. Chapter 2 Monk arrived early to meet John Evan and find out what Lamb had so far learned of the murder of Lord Shelburne's brother, Jocelyn Gray. He still had some sense of apprehension. His discoveries about himself had been commonplace, such small things as one might learn of anyone. Likes and dislikes, vanities, his wardrobe had plainly shown him those, discourtesies, such as had made the desk sergeant nervous of him. But the remembered warmth of Northumberland was still with him, and it was enough to buoy up his spirits. And he must work. The money wouldn't last much longer. John Evan was a tall young man, and lean almost to the point of appearing frail. But Monk judged from the way he stood that it was a deception. He might well be wiry under that rather elegant jacket, and the air with which he wore his clothes was a natural grace rather than effeminacy. His face was sensitive, all eyes and nose, and his hair waved back from his brow, thick and honey-brown. Above all, he appeared intelligent, which was both necessary to Monk and frightening. He was not yet ready for a companion of such quick sight or subtlety of perception. But he had no choice in the matter. Rancorn introduced Evan, banged a pile of papers on the wide, scratched wooden table in Monk's office, a good-sized room, crammed with filing drawers and bookcases, and with one sash window overlooking an alley. The carpet was a domestic cast-off, but better than the bare wood, 
and there were two leather-seated chairs. Runcorn went out, leaving them alone. Evan hesitated for a moment, apparently not wishing to usurp authority. Then, as Monk didn't move, he put out a long finger and touched the top of the pile of papers. Those are all the statements from the witnesses, sir. Not very helpful, I'm afraid. Monk said the first thing that came to him. Were you with Mr. Lamb when they were taken? Yes, sir. All except the street sweeper. Mr. Lamb saw him while I went after the cabbie. Cabbie? For a moment, Monk had a wild hope that the assailant had been seen, was known, that it was merely his whereabouts that were needed. Then the thought died immediately. It would hardly have taken them six weeks if it were so simple. And more than that, there had been in Runcorn's face a challenge, even a kind of perverse satisfaction. The cabbie that brought Major Grey home, sir, Evan said, demolishing the hope apologetically. Oh. Monk was about to ask him if there was anything useful in the man's statement, then realized how inefficient he would appear. He had all the papers in front of him. He picked up the first, and Evan waited silently by the window while he read. It was in neat, very legible writing, and headed at the top was the statement of Mary Ann Brown, seller of ribbons and laces in the street. Monk imagined the grammar to have been altered somewhat from the original, and a few aspirates put in, but the flavour was clear enough. I was standing in my usual place in Doughty Street near Mecklenburg Square, like as I always do, on the corner, knowing as how there is ladies living in many of them buildings, especially ladies as has their own maids what does so in for them, and the like. Question from Mr. Lamb. So you were there at six o'clock in the evening? I suppose I must have been, though I can't tell the time and I don't have no watch but I'd seed the gentleman arrive what was killed. Something terrible, that is, when even the gentry's not safe. You saw Major Grey arrive? Yes, sir. What a gentleman he looked, all happy and jaunty-like. Was he alone? Yes, sir. He was. Did he go straight in, after paying the cabbie, of course? Yes, sir, he did. What time did you leave Mecklenburg Square? Don't rightly know, not for sure, but I heard the church clock at St. Mark's strike the quarter just afore I got there. Home? Yes, sir. And how far is your home from Mecklenburg Square? About a mile, I reckon. Where do you live? Off the Pentonville Road, sir. Half an hour's walk? Bless you, no, sir, more like a quarter. A sight too wet to be hanging around, it was. Besides... Girls as hang around that time of an evening get themselves misunderstood, or worse. Quite. So you left Mecklenburg Square about seven o'clock? Reckon so. Did you see anyone else go into number six, after Mr. Grey? Yes, sir. One other gentleman in a black coat with a big fur collar. There was a note in brackets after the last statement to say it had been established that this person was a resident of the apartments, and no suspicion attached to him. The name of Mary Ann Brown was written in the same hand at the bottom, and a rough cross placed beside it. Monk put it down. It was a statement of only negative value. It made it highly unlikely that Jocelyn Gray had been followed home by his murderer. But then the crime had happened in July, when it was still light till nine in the evening. A man with murder, or even robbery on his mind, wouldn't wish to be seen so close to his victim. By the window, Evan stood still, watching him, ignoring the clatter in the street beyond, a drayman shouting as he backed his horse, a coster calling his wares, and the hiss and rattle of carriage wheels. Monk picked up the next statement, in the name of Alfred Crescent, a boy of eleven who swept a crossing at the corner of Mecklenburg Square and Doughty Street, keeping it clear of horse droppings principally and any other litter that might be let fall. His contribution was much the same, 
except that he had not left Doughty Street until roughly half an hour after the ribbon girl. The cabbie claimed to have picked Gray up at a regimental club a little before six o'clock and driven him straight to Mecklenburg Square. His fare had done no more than pass the time of day with him, some trivial comment about the weather, which had been extraordinarily unpleasant, and wished him a good night upon leaving. He could recall nothing more, and to the best of his knowledge they hadn't been followed or especially remarked by anyone. He had seen no unusual or suspicious characters in the neighbourhood of Guildford Street or Mecklenburg Square, either on the way there or on his departure. Only the usual peddlers, street sweepers, flower sellers, and a few gentlemen of unobtrusive appearance who might have been clerks returning home after a long day's work, or pickpockets awaiting a victim, or any of a hundred other things. This statement also was of no real help. Monk put it on top of the other two, then looked up and found Evan's gaze still on him, shyness tinged with a faint self-deprecating humour. Instinctively he liked Evan. Or could it be just loneliness? Because he had no friend, no human companionship deeper than the courtesies of office, or the impersonal kindness of Mrs. Worley fulfilling her Christian duty. Had he had friends before? Or wanted them? If so, where were they? Why had no one welcomed him back? Not even a letter. The answer was unpleasant and obvious. He hadn't earned such a thing. He was clever, ambitious, a rather superior rat-catcher. Not appealing. But he mustn't let Evan see his weakness. He must appear professional, in command, "'Are they all like this?' he asked. "'Pretty much,' Evan replied, standing more upright now that he was spoken to. "'Nobody saw or heard anything that has led us even to a time or a description. "'For that matter, not even a definite motive.' "'Monk was surprised. "'It brought his mind back to the business. "'He mustn't let it wander. "'It would be hard enough to appear efficient without wool-gathering.' "'Not robbery.' he asked. Evan shook his head and shrugged very slightly. Without effort, he had the elegance Monk strove for, and Runcorn missed absolutely. Not unless he was frightened off, he answered. There was money in Gray's wallet and several small, easily portable ornaments of value round the room. One fact that might be worth something, though. He had no watch on. Gentlemen of his sort usually have rather good watches, engraved, that sort of thing. And he did have a watch chain. Monk sat on the edge of the table. Could he have pawned it? he asked. Did anyone see him with a watch? It was an intelligent question, and it came to him instinctively. Even well-to-do men sometimes ran short of ready money, or dressed and dined beyond their means and were temporarily embarrassed. How had he known to ask that? Perhaps his skill was so deep it wasn't dependent on memory. Evan flushed faintly, and his hazel eyes looked suddenly awkward. I'm afraid we didn't find out, sir. I mean, the people we asked didn't seem to recall clearly. Some said they remembered something about a watch, others that they didn't. We couldn't get a description of one. We wondered if he might have pawned it too, but we didn't find a ticket, and we tried the local pawn shops. Nothing. Evan shook his head. Nothing at all, sir. So we wouldn't know it, even if it turned up, Monk said disappointedly, jerking his hand at the door. Some miserable devil could walk in here sporting it, and we should be none the wiser. Still, I dare say if the killer took it, he would have thrown it into the river when the hue and cry went up anyway. If he didn't, he's too daft to be out on his own. He twisted around to look at the pile of papers again, and riffled through them untidily. What else is there? The next was the account of the neighbour opposite. One Albert Scarsdale, very bare and prickly. 
Obviously, he had resented the inconsideration, the appalling bad taste of Grey in getting himself murdered in Mecklenburg Square, and felt the less he said about it himself, the sooner it would be forgotten, and the sooner he might dissociate himself from the whole sordid affair. He admitted he thought he had heard someone in the hallway between his apartment and that of Grey at about eight o'clock, and possibly again at about quarter to ten. He couldn't possibly say whether it was two separate visitors or one arriving and then later leaving. In fact, he wasn't sure beyond doubt that it hadn't been a stray animal, a cat, or the porter making a round. From his choice of words, he regarded the two as roughly equal. It might even have been an errand boy who had lost his way, or any of a dozen other things. He had been occupied with his own interests. And had seen and heard nothing of remark. The statement was signed and affirmed as being true, with an ornate and ill-natured signature. Monk looked across at Evan, still waiting by the window. Mister Scarsdale sounds like an officious and unhelpful little beggar, he observed dryly. Very, sir, Evan agreed, his eyes shining but no smile touching his lips. I imagine it's the scandal in the buildings, attracts notice from the wrong kind of people, and very bad for the social reputation. Something less than a gentleman. Monk made an immediate and cruel judgment. Evan pretended not to understand him, although it was a patent lie. Less than a gentleman, sir. His face puckered. Monk spoke before he had time to think. Or wonder why he was so sure. Certainly, someone secure in his social status would not be affected by a scandal whose proximity was only a geographical accident and nothing to do with him personally. Unless, of course, he knew Gray well. No, sir, Evan said, but his eyes showed his total comprehension. Obviously, Scarsdale still smarted under Gray's contempt. And Monk could imagine it vividly. No, he disclaimed all personal acquaintance with him, and either that's a lie or else it's very odd. If he were the gentleman he pretends to be, he would surely know Gray at least to speak to. They were immediate neighbours after all. Monk didn't want to court disappointment. It may be no more than social pretension, but worth inquiring into. He looked at the papers again. What else is there? He glanced up at Evan. Who found him, by the way? Evan came over and sorted out two more reports from the bottom of the pile. He handed them to Monk. Cleaning woman and the porter, sir. Their accounts agree, except that the porter says a bit more because naturally we asked him about the evening as well. Monk was temporarily lost, as well. Evan flushed faintly with irritation at his own lack of clarity. He wasn't found until the following morning, when the woman who cleans and cooks for him arrived and couldn't get in. He wouldn't give her a key. Apparently, didn't trust her. He let her in himself, and if he wasn't there, then she just went away and came another time. Usually, he leaves some message with the porter. I see. Did he go away often? I assume we know where to. There was an instinctive edge of authority to his voice now, and impatience. Occasional weekend, so far as the porter knows. Sometimes longer, a week or two at a country house in the season. Evan answered. So what happened when Mrs. What's her name arrived? Evan stood almost to attention. Huggins, she knocked as usual. When she got no answer after the third attempt, she went down to see the porter Grimwade to find out if there was a message. Grimwade told her he'd seen Gray arrive home the evening before, and he hadn't gone out yet, and to go back and try again. Perhaps Gray had been in the bathroom or unusually soundly asleep, and no doubt he'd be standing at the top of the stairs by now, wanting his breakfast. But of course he wasn't," Monk said unnecessarily. "No, 
Mrs. Huggins came back a few moments later, all fussed and excited. These women love a little drama. And demanded that Grimway do something about it. To her endless satisfaction, Evan smiled bleakly. She said that he'd be lying there murdered in his own blood, and they should do something immediately and call the police. She must have told me that a dozen times. He pulled a small face. She's now convinced she has the second sight, and I spent a quarter of an hour persuading her that she should stick to cleaning and not give it up in favor of fortune-telling. Although she's already a heroine, of sorts, in the local newspaper... And, no doubt, the local pub. Monk found himself smiling, too. One more save from a career in the fairground stalls, and still in the service of the gentry, he said. Heroin for a day, and free gin every time she retells it for the next six months. Did Grimway go back with her? Yes, with the master key, of course. And what did they find? Exactly. This was perhaps the most important single thing, the precise facts of the discovery of the body. Evan concentrated till Monk wasn't sure if he was remembering the witness's words or his own sight of the rooms. The small outer hall was perfectly orderly, Evan began. The usual things you might expect to see. Stand for coats and things and hats. Rather a nice stand for sticks, umbrellas and so forth. Box for boots, a small table for calling cards, nothing else. Everything was neat and tidy. The door from that led directly into the sitting room, and the bedroom and utilities were off that. A shadow passed over his extraordinary face. He relaxed a little, and half unconsciously leaned against the window frame. That... Next room was a different matter altogether. The curtains were drawn, and the gas was still burning, even though it was daylight outside. Gray himself was lying half on the floor and half on the big chair, head downward. There was a lot of blood, and he was in a pretty dreadful state. His eyes didn't waver, but it was with an effort, and Monk could see it. I must admit, he continued, I've seen a few deaths, but this was the most brutal by a long way. The man had been beaten to death with something quite thin. I mean, not a bludgeon. Hit a great many times. There had pretty obviously been a fight. A small table had been knocked over and one leg broken off. Several ornaments were on the floor, and one of the heavy stuffed chairs was on its back, the one he was half on. Evan was frowning at the memory, and his skin was pale. The other rooms hadn't been touched. He moved his hands in a gesture of negation. It was quite a while before we could get Mrs. Huggins into a sane state of mind, and then persuade her to look at the kitchen and bedroom. But eventually she did, and said they were just as she had left them the previous day. Monk breathed in deeply, thinking... He must say something intelligent, not some fatuous comment on the obvious. Evan was watching him, waiting. He found himself self-conscious. So, it would appear he had a visitor sometime in the evening, he said more tentatively than he had wished. Who quarreled with him or else simply attacked him. There was a violent fight, and Grey lost. More or less, Evan agreed, straightening up again. At least, we don't have anything else to go on. We don't even know if it was a stranger or someone he knew. No sign of a forced entry? No, sir. Anyway, no burglar is likely to force an entry into a house when all the lights are still on. No. Monk cursed himself for an idiotic question. Was he always such a fool? There was no surprise in Evan's face. Good manners? Or fear of angering a superior not noted for tolerance? No, of course not, he said aloud. I suppose he wouldn't have been surprised by Grey and then lit the lights to fool us. 
Unlikely, sir. If he were that cool-headed, he surely would have taken some of the valuables. At least the money in Gray's wallet, which would be untraceable. Monk had no answer for that. He sighed and sat down behind the desk. He didn't bother to invite Evan to sit also. He read the rest of the porter's statement. Lamb had asked exhaustively about all visitors the previous evening, if there had been any errand boys, messengers, even a stray animal. Grimwade was affronted at the very suggestion. Certainly not. Errand boys were always escorted to the appropriate place, or, if possible, their errands taken over by Grimwade himself. No stray animal had ever tainted the buildings with its presence. Dirty things, stray animals, and apt to soil the place. What did the police think he was? Were they trying to insult him? Monk wondered what Lamb had replied. He would certainly have had a pointed answer to the man on the relative merits of stray animals and stray humans. A couple of acid retorts rose to his mind even now. Grimwade swore there had been two visitors, and only two. He was perfectly sure no others had passed his window. The first was a lady at about eight o'clock, and he would sooner not say upon whom she called. A question of private affairs must be treated with discretion. But she hadn't visited Mr. Gray, of that he was perfectly certain. Anyway, she was a very slight creature, and couldn't possibly have inflicted the injuries suffered by the dead man. The second visitor was a man who called upon a Mr. Yates, a long-time resident, and Grimwade had escorted him as far as the appropriate landing himself, and seen him received. Whoever had murdered Gray had obviously either used one of the other visitors as a decoy, or else had already been in the building in some guise in which he had so far been overlooked. So much was logic. Monk put the paper down. They would have to question Grimwade more closely, explore even the minutest possibilities. There might be something. Evan sat down on the window ledge. Mrs. Huggins' statement was exactly as Evan had said, if a good deal more verbose. Monk read it only because he wanted time to think. Afterwards... He picked up the last one, the medical report. It was the one he found most unpleasant, but maybe also the most necessary. It was written in a small, precise hand, very round. It made him imagine a small doctor with round spectacles and very clean fingers. It didn't occur to him until afterwards to wonder if he had ever known such a person and if it was the first wisp of memory returning. The account was clinical in the extreme, discussing the corpse as if Jocelyn Gray were a species rather than an individual, a human being full of passions and cares, hopes and humours, who had been suddenly and violently cut off from life, and who must have experienced terror and extreme pain in the few minutes that were being examined so unemotionally. The body had been looked at a little after 9.30 a.m. It was that of a man in his early thirties, of slender build but well nourished, and not apparently suffering from any illness or disability, apart from a fairly recent wound in the upper part of the right leg, which might have caused him to limp. The doctor judged it to be a shallow wound, such as he had seen in many ex-soldiers, and to be five or six months old. The body had been dead between eight and twelve hours. He couldn't be more precise than that. The cause of death was obvious for anyone to see. A succession of violent and powerful blows about the head and shoulders with some long, thin instrument. A heavy cane or stick seemed the most likely. Monk put down the report, sobered by the details of death. The bare language, shorn of all emotion, perversely brought the very feeling of it closer. His imagination saw it sharply, even smelled it, conjuring up the sour odour and the buzz of flies. Had he dealt with many murders? He could hardly ask. Very unpleasant, he said, without looking up at Evan. Very, 
Evan agreed, nodding. Newspapers made rather a lot of it at the time. Been going on at us for not having found the murderer. Apart from the fact that it's made a lot of people nervous, Mecklenburg Square is a pretty good area. And if one isn't safe there, where is one safe? Added to that, Jocelyn Gray was a well-liked, pretty harmless young ex-officer and of extremely good family. He served in the Crimea and was invalided out. He had rather a good record, saw the charge of the Light Brigade, badly wounded at Sebastopol. Evan's face pinched a little with a mixture of embarrassment and perhaps pity. A lot of people feel his country has let him down, so to speak. First, by allowing this to happen to him, and then by not even catching the man who did it. He looked across at Monk, apologising for the injustice, and because he understood it. I know that's unfair, but a spot of crusading sells newspapers. Always helps to have a cause, you know. And, of course, the running patras have composed a lot of songs about it. Returning hero and all that. Monk's mouth turned down at the corners. Have they been hitting hard? Rather, Evan admitted with a little shrug. And we haven't a blind thing to go on. We've been over and over every bit of evidence there is. And there's simply nothing to connect him to anyone. Any ruffian could have come in from the street if he dodged the porter. Nobody saw or heard anything useful. And we are right where we started. He got up gloomily and came over to the table. I suppose you'd better see the physical evidence, not that there is much. And then I dare say you'd like to see the flat, at least get a feeling for the scene. Monk stood up also. Yes, I would. You never know. Something might suggest itself. Although he could imagine nothing. If Lamb hadn't succeeded, and this keen, delicate young junior, what was he going to find? He felt failure begin to circle around him, dark and enclosing. Had Rancorn given him this, knowing he would fail? Was it a discreet and efficient way of getting rid of him without being seen to be callous? How did he even know for sure that Rancorn wasn't an old enemy? Had he done him some wrong long ago? The possibility was cold and real. The shadowy outline of himself that had appeared so far was devoid of any quick acts of compassion, any sudden gentlenesses or warmth to seize hold of and to like. He was discovering himself as a stranger might, and what he saw so far did not excite his admiration. He liked Evan far more than he liked himself. He had imagined he had hidden his complete loss of memory. But perhaps it was obvious. Perhaps Runcorn had seen it, and taken this chance to even some old score. God, how he wished he knew what kind of man he was, had been. Who loved him? Who hated him? And who had what cause? Had he ever loved a woman, or any woman loved him? He didn't even know that. Evan was walking quickly ahead of him, his long legs carrying him at a surprisingly fast pace. Everything in Monk wanted to trust him, and yet he was almost paralysed by his ignorance. Every foothold he trod on dissolved into quicksand under his weight. He knew nothing. Everything was surmise, constantly shifting guesses. He behaved automatically, having nothing but instinct, and ingrained habit to rely on. The physical evidence was astonishingly bare, set out like luggage in a lost and found office, ownerless. Pathetic and rather embarrassing remnants of someone else's life, robbed now of their purpose and meaning, a little like his own belongings in Grafton Street, objects whose history and emotion would obliterate it. He stopped beside Evan and picked up a pile of clothes. The trousers were dark, well cut from expensive material, now spotted with blood. 
The boots were highly polished and only slightly worn on the soles. Personal linen was obviously changed very recently. Shirt was expensive. Cravat, silk. The neck and front heavily stained. The jacket was tailored to high fashion, but ruined with blood and a ragged tear in the sleeve. They told him nothing, except a hazard at the size and build of Jocelyn Gray, and an admiration for his pocket and his taste. There was nothing to be deduced from the bloodstains, since they already knew what the injuries had been. He put them down and turned to Evan, who was watching him. Not very helpful, is it, sir? Evan looked at them with a mixture of unhappiness and distaste. There was something in his face that might have been real pity. Perhaps he was too sensitive to be a police officer. No, not very, Monk agreed dryly. What else was there? The weapon, sir. Evan reached out and picked up a heavy ebony stick with a silver head. It too was encrusted with blood and hair. Monk winced. If he had seen such grisly things before, his immunity to them had gone with his memory. Nasty. Evan's mouth turned down, his hazel eyes on Monk's face. Monk was conscious of him and abashed. Was the distaste, the pity, for him? Was Evan wondering why a senior officer should be so squeamish? He conquered his revulsion with an effort and took the stick. It was unusually heavy. War wound, Evan observed, still watching him. From what witnesses say, he actually walked with it. I mean, it wasn't an ornament. Right leg, Monk recalled the medical report. Accounts for the weight. He put the stick down. Nothing else. A couple of broken glasses, sir, and a decanter broken too. Must have been on the table that was knocked over from the way it was lying. And a couple of ornaments. There's a drawing of the way the room was in Mr. Lamb's file, sir. Not that I know of anything it can tell us, but Mr. Lamb spent hours poring over it. Monk felt a quick stab of compassion for Lamb, then for himself. He wished for a moment that he could change places with Evan, leave the decisions, the judgments to someone else, and disclaim the failure. He hated failure. He realized now what a driving, burning desire he had to solve this crime, to win, to wipe that smile off Runcorn's face. Oh, money, sir. Evan pulled out a cardboard box and opened it. He picked up a fine pigskin wallet, and separately, several gold sovereigns, a couple of cards from a club, and an exclusive dining room. There were about a dozen cards of his own, engraved, Major, the Honourable Jocelyn Gray, 6 Mecklenburg Square, London. Is that all? Monk asked. Yes, sir. The money is twelve pounds, seven shillings and sixpence altogether. If he were a thief, it's odd he didn't take that. Perhaps he was frightened. He may have been hurt himself. It was the only thing he could think of. He motioned Evan to put the box away. I suppose we'd better go and have a look at Mecklenburg Square. Yes, sir. Evan straightened up to obey. It's about half an hour's walk. Are you well enough for it yet? A couple of miles? For heaven's sake, man, it was my arm I broke, not both my legs. He reached sharply for his jacket and hat. Evan had been a little optimistic. Against the wind, and stepping carefully to avoid peddlers and groups of fellow travellers on the footpath, and traffic, and horse dung in the streets, it was a good forty minutes before they reached Mecklenburg Square, walked around the gardens, and stopped outside number six. The boy sweeping the crossing was busy on the corner of Doughty Street, and Monk wondered if it was the same one who had been there on that evening in July. He felt a rush of pity for the child, out in all weather, often with sleet or snow, driving down the funnel of the high buildings, dodging in among the carriages and drays, shoveling droppings. What an abysmal way to earn your keep. 
Then he was angry with himself. That was stupid and sentimental nonsense. He must deal with reality. He squared his chest and marched into the foyer. The porter was standing by a small office doorway, no more than a cubbyhole. Yes, sir. He moved forward courteously, but at the same time blocking their further progress. Grimwade, Monk asked him. Yes, sir. The man was obviously surprised and embarrassed. I'm sorry, sir. I can't say as I remember you. I'm not usually bad about faces. He let it hang, hoping Monk would help him. He glanced across at Evan, and a flicker of memory lit in his face. Police, Monk said simply. We'd like to take another look at Major Gray's flat. You have the key. The man's relief was very mixed. Oh yes, sir, and we ain't let nobody in. Lock still as Mister Lamb left it. Good, thank you. Monk had been preparing to show some proof of his identity, but the porter was apparently quite satisfied with his recognition of Evan, and turned back to his cubbyhole to fetch the key. He came with it a moment later and led them upstairs with the solemnity due the presence of the dead. Especially those who had died violently. Monk had the momentarily unpleasant impression that they would find Jocelyn Gray's corpse still lying there, untouched, and waiting for them. It was ridiculous, and he shook it off fiercely. It was beginning to assume the repetitive quality of a nightmare, as if events could happen more than once. Here we are, sir. Evan was standing at the door, the porter's key in his hand. There's a back door as well, of course, from the kitchen, but it opens onto the same landing, about twelve yards along, for services, errands, and the like. Monk recalled his attention, but one would still have to pass the porter at the gate. Oh yes, sir. I suppose there's not much point in having a porter if there's a way in without passing him. Then any beggar or peddler could bother you. He pulled an extraordinary face as he pondered the habits of his betters, or creditors. He added lugubriously, "Quite." Monk was sardonic. Evan turned and put the key in the lock. He seemed reluctant, as if a memory of the violence he had seen there still clung to the place, repelling him. Or was Monk projecting his own fancies onto someone else? The hallway inside was exactly as Evan had described it: neat, blue Georgian with white paint and trims, very clean and elegant. He saw the hat stand with its place for sticks and umbrellas, the table for calling cards and so forth. Evan was ahead of him, his back stiff, opening the door to the main room. Monk walked in behind him. He wasn't sure what he was expecting to see. His body was tight, also, as if waiting for an attack, for something startling and ugly on the senses. The decoration was elegant and had originally been expensive, but in the flat light, without gas or fire, it looked bleak and commonplace enough. The Wedgwood blue walls seemed at a glance immaculate, the white trims without scar. But there was a fine rime of dust over the polished wood of the chiffonier and the desk, and a film dulling colours of the carpet. His eyes travelled automatically to the window first, then around the other furniture: ornate side table with pie crust edges, a jardinier with a Japanese bowl on it, a mahogany bookcase, till he came to the overturned heavy chair, the broken table, companion to the other. The pale inner wood, a sharp scar against its mellowed satin skin. It looked like an animal with legs in the air. Then he saw the blood stain on the floor. There wasn't a lot of it, not widespread at all, but very dark, almost black. Gray must have bled a lot in that one place. He looked away from it and noticed then. That much of what seemed patterned on the carpet was probably lighter, spattered blood. On the far wall there was a picture crooked, and when he walked over to it and looked more carefully, 
he saw a bruise in the plaster, and the paint was faintly scarred. It was a bad watercolour of the Bay of Naples, all harsh blues with a conical Mount Vesuvius in the background. It must have been a considerable fight, he said quietly. Yes, sir, Evan agreed. He was standing in the middle of the floor, not sure what to do. There were several bruises on the body, arms and shoulders, and one knuckle was skinned. I should say he put up a good fight. Monk looked at him, frowning. I don't remember that in the medical report. I think it just said evidences of a struggle, sir. But that's pretty obvious from the room here, anyway. His eyes glanced around it as he spoke. There's blood on that chair as well. He pointed to the heavy, stuffed one lying on its back. That's where he was, with his head on the floor. We are looking for a violent man, sir. He shivered slightly. Yes. Monk stared around, trying to visualize what must have happened in this room nearly six weeks ago. The fear and the impact of flesh on flesh. Shadows moving. Shadows because he didn't know them. Furniture crashing over. Glass splintering. Then suddenly it became real. A flash sharper and more savage than anything his imagination had called up. Red moments of rage and terror. The flashing stick. Then it was gone again, leaving him trembling and his stomach sick. What in God's name had happened in this room that the echo of it still hung here like an agonized ghost or a beast of prey? He turned and walked out, oblivious of Evan behind him, fumbling for the door. He had to get out of here, into the commonplace and grubby street, the sound of voices, the demanding present. He wasn't even sure if Evan followed him. To listen to more audiobook and best story by and Perry for free, check Amazon Audible. Link can be found in the description or the first comment. Chapter 3 As soon as Monk was out in the street, he felt better, but he couldn't completely shake the impression that had come to him so violently. For an instant, it had been real enough to bring his body out in hot, drenching sweat, and then leave him shivering and nauseous at the sheer bestiality of it. He put up his hand shakily and felt his wet cheek. There was a hard, angular rain driving on the wind. He turned to see Evan behind him. But if Evan had felt that savage presence, there was no sign of it in his face. He was puzzled, a little concerned, but Monk could read no more in him than that. A violent man, Monk repeated Evan's words through stiff lips. Yes, sir, Evan said solemnly, catching up to him. He started to say something, then changed his mind. Where are you going to begin, sir? he asked instead. It was a moment before Monk could collect his thoughts to reply. They were walking along Doughty Street to Guildford Street, Recheck the statements, he answered, stopping on the corner curb as a hansom sped past them, its wheels spraying filth. That's the only place I know to begin. I'll do the least promising first. The street sweeper boy is there. He indicated the child a few yards from them, busy shoveling dung, and at the same time seizing a penny that had been thrown him. Is he the same one? I think so, sir. I can't see his face from here. That was something of a euphemism. The child's features were hidden by dirt and the hazards of his occupation, and the top half of his head was covered by an enormous cloth cap to protect him from the rain. Monk and Evan stepped out onto the street towards him. Well? Monk asked when they reached the boy. Evan nodded. Monk fished for a coin. He felt obliged to recompense the child for the earnings he might lose in the time forfeited. He came up with tuppence and offered it. Alfred, I'm a policeman. I want to talk to you about the gentleman who was killed in number six in the square. 
The boy took the tuppence. Yeah, Guff. I don't know anything what I didn't tell the other Rosa as asked me. He sniffed and looked up hopefully. A man with tuppence to spend was worth pleasing. Maybe not, Monk conceded. But I'd like to talk to you anyway. A tradesman's cart clattered by them towards Gray's Inn Road, splashing them with mud and leaving a couple of cabbage leaves almost at their feet. Can we go to the footpath? Monk inquired, hiding his distaste. His good boots were getting soiled, and his trouser legs were wet. The boy nodded, then acknowledging their lack of skill in dodging wheels and hooves with the professional's condescension for the amateur, he steered them to the curb again. Yes, Gov, he asked hopefully, pocketing the tuppence somewhere inside the folds of his several jackets and sniffing hard. He refrained from wiping his hand across his face in deference to their superior status. You saw Major Gray come home the day he was killed, Monk asked with appropriate gravity. Yes, Gov, and there weren't nobody following him as far as I could see. Was the street busy? No, wicked night it were for July, raining something horrible. Nobody much about, and everyone going as fast as their legs would carry them. How long have you been at this crossing? Couple of years. His faint, fair eyebrows rose with surprise. Obviously, it was a question he hadn't expected. So you must know most of the people who live around here, Monk pursued. Yes, reckon as I do. His eyes sparkled with sudden, sharp comprehension. You means, did I see anyone as don't belong? Monk nodded in appreciation of his sagacity. Precisely. He were bashed to death, weren't he? Yes. Monk winced inwardly at the appropriateness of the phrase. Then you ain't looking for a woman. No, Monk agreed. Then it flashed through his mind that a man might dress as a woman, if perhaps it were not some stranger who had murdered Gray, but a person known to him. Someone who had built up over the years the kind of hatred that had seemed to linger in that room. Unless it were a large woman, he added, and very strong, perhaps. The boy hid a smirk. Woman, as I saw, was on the little side. Most women as makes their way that fashion got to look fetching like, or least way summick as a woman ought to. Don't see no great big scrubbers round here, and no dolly mops. He sniffed again and pulled his mouth down fiercely to express his disapproval. Only the class for gentlemen as has money like what they got here. He gestured towards the elaborate house fronts behind him, towards the square. I see. Monk hid a brief amusement. And you saw some woman of that type going into number six that evening. It was probably not worth anything, but every clue must be followed at this stage. No one as don't go there regular, Gov. What time? Just as I were going home. About half past seven. That's right. How about earlier? Only what goes into number six, like. Yes. He shut his eyes in deep concentration, trying to be obliging. There might be another tuppence. One of the gentlemen what lives in number six come home with another gent, little fella, with one of them collars what looks like fur, but all curly. Astrakhan, Monk offered. I don't know what you calls it. Anyway, he went in about six, and I never saw him come out. That any up to you, Gov? It might be. Thank you very much. Monk spoke to him with all seriousness, gave him another penny to Evans' surprise, and watched him step blithely off into the thoroughfare, dodging in between traffic and take up his duties again. Evans' face was brooding, thoughtful, but whether on the boy's answers or his means of livelihood, Monk didn't ask. The ribbon seller's not here today. Evan looked up and down the Guildford Street footpath. Who do you want to try next? Monk thought for a moment. How do we find the cabby? 
I presume we have an address for him. Yes, sir. But I doubt he'd be there now. Monk turned to face the drizzling east wind. Not unless he's ill, he agreed. Good evening for trade. No one will walk in this weather if they can ride. He was pleased with that. It sounded intelligent, and it was the merest common sense. We'll send a message and have him call at the police station. I don't suppose he can add anything to what he's already said anyway. He smiled sarcastically. Unless, of course, he killed Grey himself. Evan stared at him, his eyes wide, unsure for an instant whether he was joking or not. Then Monk suddenly found he was not sure himself. There was no reason to believe the cabbie. Perhaps there had been heated words between them, some stupid quarrel, possibly over nothing more important than the fair. Maybe the man had followed Grey upstairs, carrying a case or a parcel for him, seen the flat, the warmth, the space, the ornaments, and in a fit of envy become abusive. He may even have been drunk. He wouldn't be the first cabbie to bolster himself against cold, rain, and long hours a little too generously. God help them. Enough of them died of bronchitis or consumption, anyway. Evan was still looking at him, not entirely sure. Monk spoke his last thoughts aloud. We must check with the porter that Grey actually entered alone. He might easily have overlooked a cabbie carrying baggage, invisible, like a postman. We become so used to them, the eye sees, but the mind doesn't register. It's possible. Belief was strengthening in Evan's voice. He could have set up the mark for someone else. Noted addresses or wealthy fares, likely looking victims for someone. Could be a well-paying sideline. Could indeed. Monk was getting chilled standing on the curb. Not as good as a sweeps boy for scouting the inside of a house, but better for knowing when the victim is out. If that was his idea, he certainly mistook Grey. He shivered. Perhaps we'd better call on him rather than send a message. It might make him nervous. It's late. We'll have a bit of lunch at the local public house and see what the gossip is. Then you can go back to the station this afternoon and find out if anything is known about this cabbie, what sort of reputation he has, if we know him, for example, and who his associates are. I'll try the porter again, and if possible, some of the neighbours. The local tavern turned out to be a pleasant, noisy place which served them ale and a sandwich with civility, but something of a wary eye, knowing them to be strangers, and perhaps guessing from their clothes that they were police. One or two ribald comments were offered, but apparently Grey hadn't patronised the place, and there was no particular sympathy for him, only the communal interest in the macabre that murder always wakens. Afterwards, Evan went back to the police station, and Monk returned to Mecklenburg Square and Grimwade. He began at the beginning. Yes, sir, Grimwade said patiently. Major Grey came in about a quarter after six, or a bit before, and he looked his usual self to me. He came by a cab. Monk wanted to be sure he had not led the man, suggested the answer he wanted. Yes, sir. How do you know? Did you see the cab? Yes, sir, I did. Grimwade wavered between nervousness and affront. Stop right by the door here. Not a night to walk a step as you didn't have to. Did you see the cabbie? Here. I don't understand what you're getting after. Now the affront was definitely warning. Did you see him? Monk repeated. Grimwade screwed up his face. Don't recall as I did, he conceded. Did he get down off the box, help Major Grey with a parcel or a case or anything? Not as I remember. No, he didn't. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. He never got through that door. 
That theory, at least, was gone. He should have been too old at this to be disappointed, but he had no experience to call on. It seemed to come to him easily enough, but possibly most of it was common sense. He went upstairs alone. He tried a last time to remove every vestige of doubt. Yes, sir, he did. Did he speak to you? Nothing special, as I could think of. I don't remember nothing, so I reckon it can't have been. He never said nothing about being afraid or as he was expecting anyone. But there were visitors to the buildings that afternoon and evening. Nobody as would be a murdering anyone. Indeed. Monk raised his eyebrows. You're not suggesting Major Gray did that to himself in some kind of bizarre accident, are you? Or, of course, there is the other alternative. That the murderer was someone already here. Grimwade's face changed rapidly from resignation through extreme offence to blank horror. He stared at Monk, but no words came to his brain. You have another idea? I thought not. Neither have I. Monk sighed. So, let us think again. You said there were two visitors after Major Gray came in. One woman at about seven o'clock, and a man later on at about quarter to ten. Now, who did the woman come to see, Mr. Grimwade? And what did she look like? And please, no cosmetic alterations for the sake of discretion. No what? Tell me the truth, man, Monk snapped. It could become very embarrassing for your tenants if we have to investigate it for ourselves. Grimway glared at him, but he took the point perfectly. A local lady of pleasure, sir, called Molly Ruggles, he said between his teeth. Handsome piece, with red hair. I know where she lives. I expect you understand it would come real gratifying if you could see your way clear to being discreet about who told you she was here. His expression was comical in its effort to expunge his dislike and look appealing. Monk hid a sour amusement. It would only alienate the man. I will, he agreed. It would be in his own interest also. Prostitutes could be useful informants. If well treated, who did she come to see? Mister Taylor, sir. He lives in flat number five. She comes to see him quite regular. And it was definitely her. Yes, sir. Did you take her to Mister Taylor's door? Oh no, sir. Reckon as she knows her way by now. And Mister Taylor, well, he hunched his shoulders. It won't be tactful now, would it, sir? Not as I suppose you has to be tactful in your calling," he added meaningfully. "No," Monk smiled slightly. "So you didn't leave your position when she came?" "No, sir." "Any other women come, Mister Grimwade?" He looked at him very directly. Grimwade avoided his eyes. Do I have to make my own inquiries? Monk threatened, and leave detectives here to follow people. Grimwade was shocked. His head came up sharply. You wouldn't do that, sir. They're gentlemen as lives here. They'd leave. They won't put up with that kind of thing. Then don't make it necessary. You're an odd man, Mister Monk. But there was a grudging respect behind the grievance in his voice. That was small victory in itself. I want to find the man who killed Major Gray. Monk answered him. Someone came into these buildings, found his way upstairs into that flat, and beat Major Gray with a stick over and over until he was dead, and then went on beating him afterwards. He saw Grimwade wincing, and felt the revulsion himself. He remembered the horror he had felt when actually standing in the room. Did walls retain memory? Could violence or hatred remain in the air after a deed was finished, and touch the sensitive?
the imaginative with a shadow of the horror. No, that was ridiculous. It was not the imaginative, but the nightmare ridden who felt such things. He was letting his own fear, the horror of his still occasionally recurring dreams, and the hollowness of his past extend into the present and warp his judgment. Let a little more time pass, a little more identity build, learn to know himself, and he would grow firmer memories in reality. His sanity would come back. He would have a past to root himself in, other emotions and people. Or could it be? Could it possibly be that it was some sort of mixed, dreamlike, distorted recollection coming back to him? Could he be recalling snatches of the pain and fear he must have felt when the coach turned over on him, throwing him down, imprisoning him? The scream of terror as the horse fell, the cab driver flung headlong, crushed to death on the stones of the street. He must have known violent fear, and in the instant before unconsciousness, have felt sharp, even blinding pain as his bones broke. Was that what he had sensed? Had it been nothing to do with Gray at all, but his own memory returning, just a flash, a sensation. The fierceness of the feeling long before the clarity of actual perception came back. He must learn more of himself, what he had been doing that night, where he was going, or had come from. What manner of man had he been? Whom had he cared for? Whom wronged, or whom owed? What had mattered to him? Every man had relationships. Every man had feelings, even hungers. Every man who was alive at all stirred some sort of passions in others. There must be people somewhere who had feelings about him, more than professional rivalry and resentment, surely. He couldn't have been so negative, of so little purpose that his whole life had left no mark on another soul. As soon as he was off duty, he must leave Gray, stop building the pattern piece by piece of his life, and take up the few clues to his own. Place them together with whatever skill he possessed. Grimwade was still waiting for him, watching curiously, knowing that he had temporarily lost his attention. Monk looked back at him. Well, Mister Grimwade, he said with sudden softness. What other women? Grimwade mistook the lowering tone for a further threat. One to see Mister Scarsdale, sir, although he paid me handsome not to say so. What time was it? About eight o'clock. Scarsdale had said he had heard someone at eight. Was it his own visitor he was talking about, trying to play safe in case someone else had seen her too? Did you go up with her? He looked at Grimwade. No, sir. On account of she'd been here before, and you were away like. And I knew as she was expected. He gave a slight leer, knowingly, as man to man. Monk acknowledged it. And the one at quarter to ten, he asked. The visitor for Mister Yates, I think you said. Had he been here before too? No, sir. I went up with him 'cause he didn't know Mister Yates very well, and he hadn't called here before. I said that to Mister Lamb. Indeed. Monk forbore from criticizing him over the omission of Scarsdale's woman. He would defeat his own purpose if he antagonized him any further. So you went up with this man? Yes, sir. Grimwade was firm. Saw Mister Yates open the door to him. What did he look like, this man? Grimwade screwed up his eyes. Oh, big man he was, solid, an ear. His face dropped. You don't think it was him what done it, do you? He breathed out slowly, his eyes wide. Gah! He must have been. When I thinks of it now, it might have. Monk agreed cautiously. It's possible. Would you know him if you saw him again? Grimwade's face fell. Ah, 
There you have me, sir. I don't think as I would. You see, I didn't see him close like when he was down here. And on the stairs I only looked where I was going, it being dark. He had one of them heavy coats on as it was a rotten night and raining something wicked. A natural night for anyone to have his coat turned up and his hat drawn down. I reckon he were dark. That's about all I could say for sure. And if he had a beard, it weren't much a one. He was probably clean-shaven and probably dark. Monk tried to keep the disappointment out of his voice. He mustn't let irritation push the man into saying something to please him, something less than true. He were big, sir, Grimwade said hopefully. And he were tall. Must have been six feet. That lets out a lot of people, don't it? Yes. Yes, it does, Monk agreed. When did he leave? I saw him out the corner of me eye, sir. He went past me window at about half past ten, or a little afore. Out of the corner of your eye? You're sure it was him? That should be. He didn't leave before, nor after. But he looked the same. Same coat and hat. Same size, same height. Weren't no one else like that lives here. Did you speak to him? No. He looked like he was in a bit of an hurry. Maybe he wanted to get home. It were a beastly rotten night, like I said, sir. Not fit for man or beast. Yes, I know. Thank you, Mr. Grimwade. If you remember anything more, tell me. Or leave a message for me at the police station. Good day. Good day, sir, Grimwade said with intense relief. Monk decided to wait for Scarsdale, first to tax him with his lie about the woman, then to try and learn something more about Jocelyn Gray. He realised with faint surprise that he knew almost nothing about him, except the manner of his death. Gray's life was as blank an outline as his own, a shadow man, circumscribed by a few physical facts without colour or substance that could have induced love or hate. And surely there had been hate in whoever had beaten Grey to death, and then gone on hitting and hitting him long after there was any purpose. Was there something in Grey, innocently or knowingly, that had generated such a passion? Or was he merely the catalyst of something he knew nothing of? and its victim. He went back outside into the square and found a seat from which he could see the entrance of number six. It was more than an hour before Scarsdale arrived and already beginning to get darker and colder, but Monk was compelled by the importance it had for him to wait. He saw him arrive on foot and followed a few paces after him, inquiring from Grimwade in the hall if it was indeed Scarsdale. Yes, sir, Grimwade said reluctantly, but Monk wasn't interested in the porter's misfortunes. Do you need me to take you up? No, thank you. I'll find it. And he took the stairs two at a time and arrived on the landing just as the door was closing. He strode across from the stairhead and knocked briskly. There was a second's hesitation. Then the door opened. He explained his identity and his errand tersely. Scarsdale wasn't pleased to see him. He was a small, wiry man whose handsomest feature was his fair moustache, not matched by slightly receding hair and undistinguished features. He was smartly, rather fussily dressed. I'm sorry, I can't see you this evening, he said brusquely. I have to change to go out for dinner. Call again tomorrow, or the next day. Monk was the bigger man, and in no mood to be summarily dismissed. I have other people to call on tomorrow, he said, placing himself half in Scarsdale's way. I need certain information from you now. Well, I haven't any, Scarsdale began, retreating as if to close the door. Monk stepped forward. For example, the name of the young woman who visited you the evening Major Grey was killed, and why you lied to us about her. It had the result Monk had wished. 
Scarsdale stopped dead. He fumbled for words, trying to decide whether to bluff it out or attempt a little late conciliation. Monk watched him with contempt. I, um... Scarsdale began. Why, I think you've misunderstood. Uh, he still hadn't made the decision. Monk's face tightened. Perhaps you would prefer to discuss it somewhere more discreet than the hallway. He looked towards the stairs and the landing where other doorways led off, including Gray's. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Scarsdale was now acutely uncomfortable, a fine beading of sweat on his brow. Although I really cannot tell you anything germane to the issue, you know. He backed into his own entranceway, and Monk followed. The young lady who visited me has no connection with poor Grey, and she neither saw nor heard anyone else. Monk closed the main door, then followed him into the sitting room. Then you asked her, sir? He allowed his face to register interest. Yes, of course I did. Scarsdale was beginning to regain his composure now that he was among his own possessions. The gas was lit and turned up. It glowed gently on polished leather, old turkey carpet, and silver-framed photographs. He was a gentleman, facing a mere member of Peel's police. Naturally, if there had been anything that could have assisted you in your work, I should have told you. He used the word work with a vague condescension, a mark of the gulf between them. He didn't invite Monk to sit, and remained standing himself rather awkwardly between the sideboard and the sofa. And this young lady, of course, is well known to you. Monk didn't try to keep his own sarcastic contempt out of his voice. Scarsdale was confused, not sure whether to affect insult or to prevaricate because he could think of nothing suitably crushing. He chose the latter. I beg your pardon, he said stiffly. You can vouch for her truthfulness, Monk elaborated, his eyes meeting Scarsdale's with a bitter smile. Apart from her work, he deliberately chose the same word, she is a person of perfect probity. Scarsdale coloured heavily, and Monk realised he had lost any chance of cooperation from him. You exceed your authority, Scarsdale snapped, and you are impertinent. My private affairs are no concern of yours. Watch your tongue, or I shall be obliged to complain to your superiors. He looked at Monk and decided this wasn't a good idea. The woman in question has no reason to lie, he said stiffly. She came up alone and left alone and saw no one at either time, except Grimwade, the porter, and you can ascertain that from him. No one enters these buildings without his permission, you know. He sniffed very slightly. This is not a common rooming house. His eyes glanced for a second at the handsome furnishings, then back at Monk. Then it follows that Grimwade must have seen the murderer, Monk replied, keeping his eyes on Scarsdale's face. Scarsdale saw the imputation and paled. He was arrogant and perhaps bigoted, but he wasn't stupid. Monk took what he believed might well be his best chance. You are a gentleman of similar social standing, he winced inwardly at his own hypocrisy, and an immediate neighbour of Major Gray's, you must be able to tell me something about him personally. I know nothing. Scarsdale was happy enough to change the subject, and in spite of his irritation, flattered. Yes, of course, he agreed quickly. Nothing at all? Nothing at all, Monk conceded. He was a younger brother of Lord Shelburne, you know. Scarsdale's eyes widened and at last he walked to the centre of the room and sat down on a hard-backed carved chair. He waved his arm vaguely, giving Monk permission to do so too. 
Indeed. Monk chose another hard-backed chair, so as not to be below Scarsdale. Oh yes, a very old family, Scarsdale said with relish. The Dowager Lady Shelburne, his mother, of course, was the eldest daughter of the Duke of Ruthven. At least I think it was he. Certainly the Duke of somewhere. Jocelyn Gray, Monk reminded him. Oh, very pleasant fellow, officer in the Crimea. Forgotten which regiment, but a very distinguished record. He nodded vigorously. Wounded at Sebastopol, I think he said. Then invalided out. Walked with a limp, poor devil. Not that it was disfiguring. Very good-looking fellow. Great charm. Very well liked, you know. A wealthy family. Shelburne. Scarsdale was faintly amused by Monk's ignorance, and his confidence was beginning to return. Of course. But I suppose you know, or perhaps you don't. He looked Monk up and down disparagingly. But naturally, all the money went to the eldest son, the present Lord Shelburne. Always happens that way. Everything to the eldest, along with the title, keeps the estates whole. Otherwise, everything would be in bits and pieces. Do you understand? All the power of the land gone. Monk controlled his sense of being patronized. He was perfectly aware of the laws of primogeniture. Yes, thank you. Where did Jocelyn Gray's money come from? Scarsdale waved his hands, which were small, with wide knuckles and very short nails. Oh. Business interests, I presume. I don't believe he had a great deal, but he didn't appear in any want. Always dressed well. Tell a lot from a fellow's clothes, you know. Again, he looked at Monk with a faint curl of his lip, then saw the quality of Monk's jacket and the portion of his shirt that was visible, and changed his mind. His eyes registering confusion. And as far as you know, he was neither married nor betrothed. Monk kept a stiff face and hid at least most of his satisfaction. Scarsdale was surprised at his inefficiency. Surely you know that. Yes, we know there was no official arrangement. Monk said, hastening to cover his mistake. But you are in a position to know if there was any other relationship, any one in whom he. Had an interest. Scarsdale's rather full mouth turned down at the corners. If you mean an arrangement of convenience, not that I am aware of. But then, a man of breeding doesn't inquire into the personal tastes or accommodations of another gentleman. No, I didn't mean a financial matter. I meant some lady he might have admired. Or even been courting. Scarsdale coloured angrily. Not as far as I know. Was he a gambler? I have no idea. I don't gamble myself, except with friends, of course. And Gray was not among them. I haven't heard anything, if that's what you mean. Monk realised he would get no more this evening, and he was tired. His own mystery was heavy at the back of his mind. Odd how emptiness could be so intrusive. He rose to his feet. Thank you, Mister Scarsdale. If you should hear anything to throw light on Major Gray's last few days, or who might have wished him harm, I'm sure you will let us know. The sooner we apprehend this man, the safer it will be for everyone. Scarsdale rose also. His face tightening at the subtle and unpleasant reminder that it had happened just across the hall from his own flat, threatening his security even as he stood there. Yes, naturally, he said a little sharply. Now, if you will be good enough to permit me to change, I have a dinner engagement, you know. To listen to more audio book and best story by and Perry for free, check Amazon Audible. Link can be found in the description or the first comment. Monk arrived at the police station to find Evan waiting for him. He was surprised at the sharpness of his pleasure at seeing him. 
Had he always been a lonely person? Or was this just the isolation from memory, from all that might have been love or warmth in himself? Surely there was a friend somewhere, someone with whom he had shared pleasure and pain, at least common experience. Had there been no woman? In the past, if not now, some stored-up memory of tenderness, of laughter or tears. If not, he must have been a cold fish. Was there perhaps some tragedy? Or some wrong? The nothingness was crowding in on him, threatening to engulf the precarious present. He hadn't even the comfort of habit. Evan's acute face, all eyes and nose, was infinitely welcome. Find out anything, sir? He stood up from the wooden chair in which he had been sitting. Not a lot, Monk answered with a voice that was suddenly louder, firmer than the words warranted. I don't see much chance of anyone having got in unseen, except the man who visited Yates at about quarter to ten. Grimwade said he was a biggish man, muffled up, which is reasonable on a night like that. He says he saw him leave at roughly half past ten. Took him upstairs, but didn't see him closely, and wouldn't recognize him again. Evan's face was a mixture of excitement and frustration. Damn! He exploded. Could be almost anyone then. He looked at Monk quickly, but at least we have a fair idea how he got in. That's a great step forward. Congratulations, sir. Monk felt a quick renewal of his spirits. He knew it wasn't justified. The step was actually very small. He sat down in the chair behind the desk. About six feet, he reiterated. Dark and probably clean shaven. I suppose that does narrow it a little. Oh, it narrows it quite a lot, sir, Evan said eagerly, resuming his own seat. At least we know that it wasn't a chance thief. If he called on Yates. Or said he did. He had planned it and had taken the trouble to scout the building. He knew who else lived there. And then, of course, there's Yates himself. Did you see him? No, he wasn't in. And anyway, I'd rather find out a little about him before I face him with it. Yes, yes, of course. If he knew anything, he's bound to deny it, I suppose. But the anticipation was building in Evan's face, his voice. Even his body was tightening under the elegant coat, as if he expected some sudden action here in the police station. The cabby was no good, by the way. Perfectly respectable fellow, worked this area for twenty years, got a wife and seven or eight children. Never been any complaints against him. Yes, Monk agreed. Grimwade said he hadn't gone into the building. In fact, doesn't think he even got off the box. What do you want me to do about this Yates? Evan asked, a very slight smile curling his lips. Sunday tomorrow, a bit hard to turn up much then. Monk had forgotten. You're right. Leave it till Monday. He's been there for nearly seven weeks. It's hardly a hot trail. Evan's smile broadened rapidly. Thank you, sir. I did have other ideas for Sunday. He stood up. Have a good weekend, sir. Good night. Monk watched him go with a sense of loss. It was foolish. Of course, Evan would have friends, even family and interests. Perhaps a woman. He'd never thought of that before. Somehow, it added to his own sense of isolation. What did he normally do with his own time? Had he friends outside duty? Some pursuit or pastime he enjoyed? There had to be more than this single-minded, ambitious man he had found so far. He was still searching his imagination uselessly when there was a knock on the door, hasty but not assertive, as though the person would have been pleased enough had there been no answer and he could have left again. Come in, Monk said loudly. The door opened and a stout young man came in. He wore a constable's uniform. His eyes were anxious, his rather homely face pink. Yes, Monk inquired. 
The young man cleared his throat. Um, Mr. Monk, sir? Yes, Monk said again. Should he know this man? From his wary expression, there was some history in their past which had been important, at least to him. He stood in the middle of the floor, fidgeting his weight from one foot to the other. Monk's wordless stare was making him worse. Can I do something for you? Monk tried to sound reassuring. Have you something to report? He wished he could remember the man's name. No, sir. I mean... Yes, sir. I have something to ask you. He took a deep breath. There's a report of a watch turned up at a pawnbroker's what I done this afternoon, sir, and... And I thought as it might be something to do with your gentleman as was murdered. Seeing as he didn't have no watch, just a chain like, sir. He held a piece of paper with copper plate handwriting on it, as if it might explode. Monk took it and glanced at it. It was the description of a gentleman's gold pocket watch, with the initials J.G. inscribed ornately on the cover. There was nothing written inside. He looked up at the constable. Thank you, he said with a smile. It might well be. Write initials. What do you know about it? The constable blushed scarlet. Nothing much, Mr. Monk. He swears blind as it was one of his regulars as brought it in. But you can't believe anything he says, because he would say that, wouldn't he? He don't want to be mixed up in no murder. Monk glanced at the paper again. The pawnbroker's name and address were there, and he could follow up on it any time he chose. No, he'd doubtless lie, he agreed. But we might learn something all the same, if we can prove this was Gray's watch. Thank you. Very observant of you. Uh, may I keep it? Yes, sir. We don't need it. We has lots more agin him. Now his furious pink colour was obviously pleasure and considerable surprise. He still stood rooted to the spot. Was there anything else? Monk raised his eyebrows. No, sir. No, there ain't. Thank you, sir. And the constable turned on his heel and marched out, tripping on the door sill as he went, and rocketing out into the passage. Almost immediately, the door was opened again by a wiry sergeant with a black moustache. You all right, sir? he asked, seeing Monk's frown. Yes. What's the matter with, um... He waved his hand towards the departing figure of the constable, wishing desperately that he knew the man's name. Harrison? Yes. Nothing. Just a feared of you, that's all. Which ain't hardly surprising, seeing as how you tore him off such a strip in front of the old station when that mesa slipped through his fingers. Which weren't hardly his fault, seeing as the fellow were a downright contortionist. Harder to hold than a greased piggy, were. And if we broke his neck, we'd be the ones for the eye jump before breakfast. Monk was confused. He didn't know what to say. Had he been unjust to the man? Or was there cause for whatever he had said? On the face of it, it sounded as if he had been gratuitously cruel. But he was hearing only one side of the story. There was no one to defend him, to explain to give his reasons and say what he knew, and perhaps they did not. And rack and tear as he might, there was nothing in his mind, not even Harrison's face, let alone some shred about the incident. He felt a fool sitting, staring up at the critical eyes of the sergeant, who plainly disliked him, for what he felt was fair cause. Monk ached to explain himself. Even more, he wanted to know for his own understanding. How many incidents would come up like this? Things he had done that seemed ugly from the outside to someone who didn't know his side of the story. Mr. Monk, sir. Monk recalled his attention quickly. Yes, Sergeant. I thought you might like to know as we got the magsman what snuffed old Billy Marlow. They'll swing him for sure. Right, villain. Oh, 
Thank you. Well done. He had no idea what the sergeant was talking about, but obviously he was expected to. Very well done, he added. Thank you, sir. The sergeant straightened up, then turned and left, closing the door behind him with a sharp snick. Monk bent to his work again. An hour later, he left the police station and walked slowly along the dark, wet pavements and found the way back to Grafton Street. Mrs. Worley's rooms were at least becoming familiar. He knew where to find things, and better than that, they offered privacy. No one would disturb him, intrude on his time to think, to try again to find some thread. After his meal of mutton stew and dumplings, which were hot and filling, if a little heavy, he thanked Mrs. Worley when she collected the tray, saw her down the stairs, and then began once more to go through the desk. The bills were of little use. He could hardly go to his tailor and say, What kind of man am I? What do I care about? Do you like or dislike me? And why? One small comfort he could draw from his accounts was that he appeared to have been prompt in paying them. There were no demand notices, and the receipts were all dated within a few days of presentation. He was learning something, a crumb. He was methodical. The personal letters from Beth told him much of her, of simplicity, an unforced affection, a life of small detail. She said nothing of hardships or of bitter winters, nothing even of wrecks or the lifeboatmen. Her concern for him was based on her feelings and seemed to be without knowledge. She simply translated her own affections and interests to his life and assumed his feelings were the same. He knew without needing deeper evidence that it was because he had told her nothing. Perhaps he hadn't even written regularly. It was an unpleasant thought, and he was harshly ashamed of it. He must write to her soon, compose a letter which would seem rational, and yet perhaps elicit some answer from her which would tell him more. The following morning he woke late to find Mrs. Worley knocking on the door. He let her in and she put his breakfast on the table with a sigh and a shake of her head. He was obliged to eat it before dressing, or it would have grown cold. Afterwards he resumed the search, and again it was fruitless for any sharpening of identity, anything of the man behind the immaculate, rather expensive possessions. They told him nothing, except that he had good taste, if a little predictable. Perhaps that he liked to be admired. But what was admiration worth if it was for the cost and discretion of one's belongings? A shallow man? Vain? Or a man seeking security he didn't feel, making his place in a world that he didn't believe accepted him? The apartment itself was impersonal, with traditional furniture, sentimental pictures. Surely Mrs. Worley's taste, rather than his own. After luncheon, he was reduced to the last places to seek, the pockets of his other clothes, jackets hanging in the cupboard. In the best of them, a well-cut, rather formal coat, he found a piece of paper, and on unfolding it carefully, saw that it was a printed sheet for a service of evensong at a church he didn't know. Perhaps it was close by. He felt a quickening of hope. Maybe he was a member of the congregation. The minister would know him. He might have friends there. A belief, even an office or a calling of some sort. He folded up the paper again carefully and put it in the desk, then went into the bedroom to wash and shave again and change into his best clothes and the coat from which the sheet had come. By five o'clock he was ready, and he went downstairs to ask Mrs. Worley where St. Marylebone Church might be. His disappointment was shattering when she showed complete ignorance. Temper boiled inside him at the frustration. She must know. But her placid, blunt face was expressionless. He was about to argue, to shout at her that she must know, when he realized how foolish it would be. He would only anger her, drive from himself a friend he sorely needed. 
She was staring at him, her face puckered. My, you are in a state. Let me ask Mr. Worley for you. He's a rare fine understanding of the city. Of course, I expect it's on the Marylebone Road, but exactly where, I'm sure I wouldn't know. It's a long street, that is. Thank you, he said carefully, feeling foolish. It's rather important. Going to a wedding, are you? She looked at his carefully brushed dark coat. What you want is a good cabbie, what knows his way and will get you there nice and prompt-like. It was an obvious answer, and he wondered why he hadn't thought of it himself. He thanked her, and when Mr. Worley had been asked and given his opinion that it might be opposite York Gate, he went out to look for a cab. Even song had already begun when he hurried up the steps and into the vestry. He could hear the voices lifted rather thinly in the first hymn. It sounded dutiful rather than joyous. Was he a religious man? Or, it would be truer to ask, had he been? He felt no sense of comfort or reverence now, except for the simple beauty of the stonework. He went in as quickly as he could, walking almost on the sides of his polished boots to make no noise. One or two heads turned, sharp with criticism. He ignored them and slid into a back pew, fumbling for a hymn book. Nothing sounded familiar. He followed the hymn because the tune was trite, full of musical clichés. He knelt when everyone else knelt and rose as they rose. He missed the responses. When the minister stepped into the pulpit to speak, Monk stared at him, searching his face for some flicker of memory. Could he go to this man and confide in him the truth, ask him to tell him everything he knew? The voice droned on in one platitude after another. His intention was benign, but so tied in words as to be almost incomprehensible. Monk sank deeper and deeper into a feeling of helplessness. The man didn't seem to be able to remember his own train of thought from one sentence to the next, let alone the nature and passions of his flock. When the last Amen had been sung, Monk watched the people file out, hoping someone would touch his memory, or better still, actually speak to him. He was about to give up even that, when he saw a young woman in black, slender and of medium height, dark hair drawn softly back from a face almost luminous, dark eyes and fragile skin, mouth too generous and too big for it. It wasn't a weak face, and yet it was one that could have moved easily to laughter or tragedy. There was a grace in the way she walked that compelled him to watch her. As she drew level, she became aware of him and turned. Her eyes widened, and she hesitated. She drew in her breath as if to speak. He waited, hope surging up inside him, and a ridiculous excitement, as if some exquisite realization were about to come. Then the moment vanished. She seemed to regain a mastery of herself. Her chin lifted a little, and she picked up her skirt unnecessarily and continued on her way. He went after her, but she was lost in a group of people, two of whom, also dressed in black, were obviously accompanying her. One was a tall, fair man in his mid-thirties, with smooth hair and a long-nosed, serious face. The other was a woman of unusual uprightness of carriage and features of remarkable character. The three of them walked towards the street and waiting vehicles, and none of them turned their heads again. Monk rode home in a rage of confusion, fear, and wild, disturbing hope. To listen to more audiobook and best story by and parry for free, check Amazon Audible. Link can be found in the description or the first comment.